I still have not gotten a good response. Smart Christians have tried. A bunch of people have tried. Okay, wait a minute, JP. Are you saying that I could not or did not answer that? I want to take some time, have a little fun at my buddy JP's expense. He made a statement the other day. Uh, he asked me to come on to a video that he was having with someone. It was I, I was busy and it was too late. Uh, and but I did catch a little bit. I get I think the back end of it. I'm not sure where in this video that I catch this. But he said something that said, wait a second, huh? That's not necessarily true. But I want to hear what he says. And then I will not just replay the video where I actually cover this or the other videos. But I'll just go ahead and respond to him right now yeah uh, arthur the best one for me the one that i think is irrefutable that i always bring up and i don't know if you ever seen any of my debates but this is the one that the opposition i still have not gotten a good response smart christians have tried a bunch of people have tried free gracers have tried everybody's tried i've used this one layman's gonna shake his head and go this is the jp verse as a matter of fact layman do you even know where i'm going layman you're yeah, probably James. gonna go to james 520 yeah. Correct. Yep. There you have it. Kevin even said it. This right here is the best verse. Now, let me tell you why. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, somebody that was in the truth needs to be brought back. If they weren't really in the truth, what are they being brought back to? Let them know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering to bring him back, which means he was a part of. And if it would be illogical to say you're bringing somebody back to something they're not a part of. Therefore, he was a part of it. He was in it. Some people will say, oh, this is the invisible church and the visible church. He was a part of the visible church, but that, not the invisible one. Therefore, he wasn't really safe to begin with. And they'll take 1 John 2.19. 1 John 2.19 is talking about false prophets and heretics, not a true believer. Then it says... That if you bring him back, you save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now, there are responses to that. There are, right? Like some people will say the word soul means something else. And and soul can mean life. So therefore, you could lose your life and still be saved. Now, he goes on to cover some responses that others have given, not a response that I've ever given. As a matter of fact, he and I, I think, had this conversation. And that was not the response that I gave. And so I want to go ahead and go back. And he says that that I didn't either. I'm not sure if he said I didn't answer or answered correctly or adequately. I don't know. Now, if it's adequately, I guess that's up to him or to anyone else. But let's go to this passage and look at us. Let's look at a couple of things. First of all, when we look at this text, one, I think it's important to understand what's being said and also what's not being stated. He says, my brother. Now, his, his response, his belief is that because it's my brother. So we're talking about Christians. Well, let's just deal with that before we even move forward. Let's just deal with this. Does the Bible refer to brethren when it refers to brethren as only ever mean a Christian, a believer? Well, the answer to that is no. Brethren can be used to refer to males who are physically descendants in, in terms of my siblings. It can be used to refer to obviously believers. A lot of times, as a matter of fact, many cases, brethren is used to refer to brothers who are in Christ. It's also used to kind of refer to kind of generally those who are around, those about their countrymen, other people like that. There's a couple of times, uh, such as in Matthew chapter 18, 21, let's say, then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall I, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but 70 times seven. Is he saying you only forgive your Christian brethren up to that many times or as often as you can? or just in general. Well, there were no Christian brothers at the time. And so Jesus clearly isn't talking about just uh, Christian brethren, but just men in general. So there's an example of someone being spoken of as a brother who is not a Christian. But then also another example is Hebrews 2.17. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. Is he saying that Jesus had to be made only like the Christians or made like mankind, like mankind is what he's speaking of, not about Christians. And so though there are often time, many times where brethren refers to Christians, there are also oftentimes many times where it's not referring to someone who is actually a believer. And so to start off thinking that this is about an actual brother in Christ uh, might not necessarily be the case. And I don't think it's the case here, but even if it is the case, uh, well, matter of fact, let's say this. 
let's just say, because it may very well be that he's speaking to brethren, but maybe not. But that's not the linchpin. As a matter of fact, this was one of the passages when I was I was wholeheartedly in the camp of you being able to lose your salvation. This was one of the main passages that I went to, James 519. And I would challenge people over and over again using this passage because it seems to say that a person, a Christian can turn away. Let's go back to it. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the heirs of his ways will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. And I would hear people say that, well, he's not talking about your your spiritual soul, your actual Well, No, he says, save his soul from death. And so this is talking about uh, someone dying. This is not about uh, something physical. This is a spiritual death. But let's look at the text and then let's see a couple of things. One my brethren, if any, and notice what it says, if any among you. Let's deal with that first. It's highlighted. Ain humin. Not often, not all the time, but there are often several times where ain humin is used to refer not to you or the whole of you, but amongst you, in the midst of you. For example, if I say to all these Christians that go to church, if any amongst you, um, want to hear the gospel or not saved. There are people that go to church with you this Sunday or any other Sunday and they're not saved. So when we talk kind of to the church or of the church, remember these letters are being circulated to people who are Christians, knowing full well there are those who are not Christians among them. These letters weren't written that only Christians would hear because how do you know who are only going to hear? And so Paul makes this point in some of his letters, speaking about letters being passed around and read for the for the hearing of the people. And so in this case, we have him saying, if any among you. Now, let's deal with that. I'm coming. I'm, I'm taking my time through this. I want to break this down and we'll come back and read this whole thing. I think the way it, it should be stated. But there are examples of the ain humane among you. For example, in John 12, 35, Jesus says for a little while, um, for a little while longer, the light is among you. What's the word? The writing ain humane. If you look over to the right hand side, ain humane. If I can highlight this better. Ah, there it is. Let me highlight that. Ain who men, if any among you, uh, ain who men. Well, is this light among you? Is this speaking of them, the light in them? No, it's among them, speaking of Jesus. So clearly the way that among is used is in the midst, around you, about, amongst, among you. We see that all the time, just in our regular conversations. There are things that are among us, but aren't really us. There's always somebody who may even look like us or hangs with us, but they're not really us or of us. Are you with me? Now, there's a way to say among you, meaning of you. And matter of fact, the best way to go about putting this is when you see it put this way. When you have this phrase here, if you look to the right, where ex human, which is of you or around you. But now notice in the English, it says among you. Look at what it says in verse 22. Yet now I urge you to keep your courage for there will be no loss of life among you. Well, the among you in this case is of you, none of you, any of you are you with me out of you all. And so this word ek, humane or humong in this case is of you, any of you. Now, there's a couple ways he could have put this in James. In James, he could have put use the word tis, which mean which would refer to any of them, those who are believers and not believers. If he would use that word. If someone, a certain person, tease, were to turn away or to stray, then that would that would show that a believer could lose their salvation. If he used the phrase X, who mean any of you out of you strays away, that would definitely prove that a believer could. But and who mean could be. And I think certainly in this case, definitely in this case, if any who are about you, around you, amongst you. Or you could just use the word humane. You could just use the word you, if any of you, which we also see written in English and in Greek, if any of you, pointing to the believers. So if any of you strays from the truth and one turns from the word, now the word one, here it is, this tease could have been used earlier. If this tease is used earlier, then we would have to say about the one who um, turns away. And so just, I think grammatically, the construction, if you would just use teeth in, in initially and use it here, because there's no reason why you could not have, because he's talking about two different types of people. So if anyone turns this person back, 
uh, let him know that the one who turns a sinner from the heirs of his ways will save his soul from death. Now, it's clearly talking about someone, someone dying spiritually. This is someone going to hell. But look what he's saying. A couple things we also need to, need to consider. If any among you strays from the truth, we'll come back to the truth in a second, uh, and one turns him back. This word turns back. This word, this Greek word means to turn back or to turn or to turn to. It could be either way. And I would make a big deal out of it if someone, because some version might say, if any, uh, and, and one turns him to the truth, not to signify that he was once um, a believer and then turned back to become a believer. But I don't have a problem with turning back to because I think that's the point. I think the point is this is somebody who um, heard the truth, left the truth. And if you brought them back to the truth, I do believe that. But wait a minute, Corey. Aren't, are you now saying that the person was saved? I'm not saying the person was saved. I'll, I'll, I'll cover that in just a second. But before we get there, notice what he says, though, that and one who turns a sinner from the air of his way saves his soul from death. Again, remember, this is one of the complicated passages that I struggled with. Now, this is not talking about a believer. This is talking about someone who heard the faith. How many people out there do you know have heard the gospel? Think about it. Think about it in your own walk. JP, think about this. How many of you know someone that has heard the truth, heard the gospel? What's the gospel? That we need someone to save us because why? We are sinful people and that Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood. His blood was the payment for our sin and that our faith in him and him alone will save us in Christ, will save us and give us eternal security or give us salvation. We've heard that. But then someone might say, well, I heard that, but I'm starting to have second thoughts as to whether Jesus is the only way or maybe Jesus is just a good person and he's just giving us an example. I heard the story, but I don't know if I believe that anymore. This is what he's speaking. Of. We've got this. We've got examples of this all the time. All of we know people, all of us literally know someone who is just like this, heard this, believed it in their mind. They didn't internalize it. And then have moved away from that belief. Why do I say that belief? Well, because the word that's used here is a noun, not a verb. Have strays from the truth, not strays away from having truth or from believing, uh, but the truth. Why is that important? Well, other times we see in the Bible, we see them speaking about the faith. Paul in 2 Timothy 4 says that, for I am already being poured out as a drink offered. Look what he says in verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith, not kept having faith. No, but kept the faith. This word, this construction, tain pistain, which is the faith I have kept. This is the tenets of the faith. People move away from that all the time. First Timothy 4, Paul brings up, he says, the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith. Again, the noun, not the verb. Falling away from the verb, that's losing your salvation. Falling away from the noun means you never had it. You just left that set of, that, that core set of beliefs, the, the tenets of the faith. You no longer hold to that. OK, now come back to that again. But James five, not speaking of, of brethren, of Christians um, who leave the faith, but people who are amongst the Christians. So if I write to you guys, you Christians, if any amongst you turns away from the truth and turns him back to the truth, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the heirs of his ways will save us soul from death. Now, we asked a question earlier. Is brethren always used of a uh, believer? Well, not always, but let's just say in this case, and I believe so in this case, he's referring to brethren. But what about this word here? This word sinner. Does the Bible ever refer to a believer as a sinner? Well, what's the answer? Not one time in the scriptures, not once does the Bible ever refer to a believer as a sinner, even a believer who sinned. The believer who sinned is never called a sinner. He's always called a believer. As a matter of fact, he's always called one of the believing ones. He's never, there is no example of a believer being called a sinner, but this person is called the sinner, meaning what? This person was never a believer. This person was a sinner who understood the faith, but walked away from the faith, the tenets of the faith. And whoever can turn him back to the faith will save his soul from death. Now, Truth be told, this, this is in keeping with all of chapter 5. Specifically, if you go that to verse 13, there are those that will say that this particular passage refers to physical healing. 
but it does not refer to physical healing. As a matter of fact, if it does refer to physical healing, well, then James is wrong. James is an error because James makes a statement that if you do this, then you shall be physically healed. This is speaking of a spiritual healing. Why do I say that? The word that's used here for uh, for sick and for suffering are also used of in a spiritual sense. Now, they also can mean a physical sense, but they also can mean a spiritual sense. If it's a spiritual sense, see if this makes sense. If anyone, and there it is, among you. So you're talking to believers. If anyone amongst you is spiritually suffering, not you, but someone else, spiritually suffering, meaning they need they need the Lord, uh, then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? There it is. Is anyone among you is sick, spiritually sick, needing the Lord? Here's why. Why do I say that? Then he must call for the elders of the church. And they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And look what it says. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. Now, if that is to be taken as a physical sickness, if the prayers offered in faith, he says, will restore him. How many times have we seen prayers offered in faith, either by us or even in the Bible? Paul couldn't heal himself. Paul couldn't heal Timothy, Trophimus, or People who had faith, the person that was sick and the person that was offering to heal them had faith and still couldn't heal them. This could not be a physical sickness, but a spiritual sickness. If you offer a um, prayer in faith of a spiritual sickness in terms of salvation, then what will definitely happen 100% of the time? You will be saved. How do we know? Because what he says, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven. Why has a sin been brought up if we're talking about a physical sickness? We're talking about a spiritual sickness. We're talking about salvation. Therefore, confess your sins one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of the righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man like a nature, like ours, and he prayed earnestly. Uh, and then what happens? The sky poured forth its rain. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth. So look how he's flowing in this. This is flowing, dealing with a spiritual sickness in terms of salvation. So he goes on to say that if any among you strays from the truth, just like if any among you don't have the faith and prays for it, they will be saved if they pray. If it's a if it's a prayer of faith, they will be healed. They will be saved. And the one who has heard it, and walks away from that, if you bring him back to that, they also will be saved. So that's the most important thing. So this is what John, I mean, James 5 is speaking of. He's not speaking to believers who walk away. He's speaking to believers, people who are amongst the believers. Now, more to the point, we've been told, we've been promised that a believer, a person who has the spirit will never walk away, will never turn away. It's prophesied by God. God of all people says that in Jeremiah 39, he says that I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me always for their own good and for the good of their children after them. Look what he says. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And look what he says, uh, that I will not turn away from them to do them good. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts. So what? So that they will not turn away from me. So the person that has the spirit in their heart, God says they will not turn away from me. Well, but Corey, he's speaking of Israel. So are the Jews the only one that have the spirit in them or is it all of us? Jesus says, it speaks in John 1, that it's whoever it happens to be. So he speaks kind of uh, wholly of not just Jews, but also Gentiles. And then Paul tells us in Romans that all of us who have the spirit are sons of God. And he tells us if all of us who are in Christ have been baptized in the spirit, we all have the spirit. And so Jeremiah tells us, well, God tells us through Jeremiah that once he, once God does that, you will never turn away. And if you are a sheep, what does he say? You will always be a sheep. And uh, let's go to Micah 5, 4. He says, and he will arise and shepherd his flock. Who is that? That's God. That's the Lord. In the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God. And they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. Who will remain? The sheep will remain. Sheep don't turn away. Sheep don't ever leave. If they, according to Jesus in John 10, they will never go after a strange voice. And if they hear a stranger's voice, what will they do? Jesus says they will flee and run away because they don't know him. And so going back to James 5, I think this is pretty clear. Again, I had the same struggle, JP. Uh, my brethren, if any amongst you, if any amongst the Christians, 
if any amongst the believers strays from the belief, the set of facts, the truth, and one turns him back to those to that very truth, let him know that he who turns the sinner never ever spoken of as a believer, believers never called a sinner, but the sinner is someone who's never had Christ, as it's always been in the Bible. Whoever turns that sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So that's what the passage means. That's what we should take it as. He's not saying that he's giving um, a person the ability to, once they have the spirit in them, to turn and walk away. But what you will you do? You will turn a sinner who's never, ever been a believer to becoming a believer, to becoming one of the brethren. So now to answer the question, hopefully JP will, now he can deal with it. JP, you can deal with it, or you can say that now he's never answered a question. He can't say that, but he'll, maybe he'll say, haven't answered the question adequately. But go and look at every example that I've given and see if what I'm saying is true. As a matter of fact, follow the understanding of what James is saying, even in James 5, and see what James is speaking of and how he makes a real nice segue from, 5, from 513 all the way to 519, 520. And then you'll have your answer and know that Jesus is not saying, James is not saying, I'm sorry, that a person can leave, turn away from after having believing, and then stop believing. Amen.